everyone. Uh, so the speaker that I originally had scheduled for today, Carolyn Box from Five Gyres, had to reschedule. She will be here in the fall. Uh, and Ivano volunteered to step in and give a talk. And preparing a talk is a lot of work. So we thank you for doing that on short notice. So without further ado. That's why I'm here, because you really wanted me to be here, not because I'm <laughs> replacing someone. Okay, let me get that light off my face, because it's like being a... Oh, what's that light? Can we turn that light off? <laughs> That's good, right? Okay. Oh, was it for recording? All right. I don't know. I don't know what I did, so I have no idea. All right. Well, it's going to be a little dark recording, but so thank you for having me here today. <laughs> and uh, it's actually I'm really excited to uh, share with you this presentation, um, which I actually did present in the past. But actually, we got just a, a new paper accepted on this uh, really cool topic. So I'm more excited than before to share it with you. And it's a really in, you know, in my very short career, it's, a, it's one of the most fascinating uh, uh, kind of really weird thing that happened uh, during an oceanographic cruise and, and everything that happened afterwards. So I hope you can also share with me the, the, uh, the amazement that, uh, you know, we, I had and my colleagues had. And also the theme is Alice in the Wonderland. And actually you'll see there's a lot of analogies with Alice in the Wonderland. Uh, so the, the down the rabbit hole because we're going to talk about something that is sea floor or a bottom that really doesn't have any bottom. So it's really a weird place on Earth. But first, let me introduce you to uh, deep hypersim and anoxic basins. I think some of you have heard about uh, this very unique uh, habitats. And actually, the picture you see here is from my uh, friend Catherine Pierre. This is one of the uh, brines. Those are deep sea brines that occur in the Mediterranean Sea. And what you're seeing here is the surface of this brine. So we're at 3,000 meters water depth, and that's salty, crusty uh, water, hypersaline water. So let me uh, take you through a, oh, and uh, of course, so Alice in the Wonderland, uh, a pool of tears. So there's a salty, salty basin in the deep ocean. And this is actually a really cool footage from, which I didn't take personally, from the Gulf of Mexico. So we're 2,300 meters below the surface of the water, and this is a, a wave propagating at the, at the top of one of those brines. And they have waves, beaches, beach deposits. So it's very much like a world beneath you know, the regular world. And, uh, and there was a paper that came out uh, one month ago, two months ago, um, which I'll show you in the end, but I'll give you a little uh, highlight. It shows that actually the waves can be as high as 300 meters. It's really cool. So I'll show you uh, a little figure from that paper. So again, um, deep hypersinian oxid basin, or DHSBs, uh, a very faster way to call those things, are very crusty, very salty bodies of water. Those are a few facts. They've been discovered only recently, just since the 80s. And actually, uh, after a few years, it was clear that there's really uh, this very insane place for life were actually populated by microbes, which is why actually we went on this cruise to look for microbial activity. And uh, in general, uh, deep hypersemian oxid basin are depressions on the seafloor, which range from a few tens to kilometers, tens of meters to kilometers. Uh, salinity can be up to 10 times more than seawater salinity. So you can imagine how dense and salty those bodies of water are. And there's no light, there's no photosynthesis there, mostly chemosynthesis, so microbial driven chemosynthesis. And the pressure conditions are very high, up to 350 times more than at the surface. And actually, this picture is from my colleague Andreas Teske, who was trying to die with the Alvin in one of the uh, largest known uh, deep hypersemian oxid basins in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the Orcas Basin. And actually, this is a picture of, of the so cool, of the halocline. So you can see this bright line here. So this is actually where there's a change in, uh, in salt water concentration. You go from normal salinity to, 
much higher salinity. And actually, in this dive, they were trying to sink into the basin, but they couldn't because the buoyancy was so high that even with full thrusters, they couldn't go down. So they were just stuck there trying to go down. And uh, not only submersibles get stuck, but also uh, biological material that's falling from the surface. And you can see this, um, you know, particles stuck basically neutral buoyancy at this uh, uh, Kim climb. So how do they form? Well, first of all, they form whenever you have salt, and usually it's ancient salt, fossil salt, like in this case here, this is the Gulf of Mexico. There are uh, salt deposits, they're actually upwelling. Salt is actually very buoyant. And once the salt gets exposed on the seafloor, it, uh, you know, it starts to uh, turn into the main components of salt, sodium chloride and uh, magnesium and such. And then the water turns salty. And usually uh, the up upwelling of salt is related to faulting activity. And in the case of Gulf of Mexico, the salt is actually as ancient as uh, 200 million years. So ancient salt cropping out on the seafloor. And the bumpiness of the Gulf of, uh, of, the Gulf of uh, say California, Mexico is actually due to the fact that you have these salt wedges that are basically pushing on the seafloor and creating those ridges and valleys. So salt crops out on the seafloor and eventually uh, the salt starts being released in the water. So therefore, the the, um, the chemistry of this very enclosed basin is very different from the open ocean uh, uh, chemistry, so a very prominent halocline develops. And the first thing that goes away is oxygen. So these basins are usually anoxic. And, uh, and they're pretty much isolated from the main ocean oceanic current. The other thing that happens is that uh, oftentimes these salt uh, upwellings of salt are related, are related to fluids. Uh, of uh, hydrocarbons like methane and such. So, and we'll, we'll learn more about how this is important to understand the system. But that's usually how they develop uh, over time. And uh, um, uh, across the planet, there are probably, I would say, approximately 100 uh, deep hypersalian oxic basins, large uh, basins have been identified. And the interesting thing is that they're all very different from each other because they're composition depends on the type of salt they are cropping. Now, and I'm going to go on a lengthy description of evaporites, but essentially salt deposits can have very different chemical composition. So the composition of the deep hypersenium anoxic basin reflect this composition. And uh, they're very extreme environment for life, obviously. Well, temperature can be up to 50 degrees Celsius. The one I'm going to talk to you about today actually has really high temperatures. Salinis, as I said, can be more than 10 times seawater. And methane concentration can be the highest we can find on the planet, and also concentration of sulfides and other chemicals. The other thing that's important to the story is that oftentimes, deep hypersenium and oxic basins are, are found in association with mud volcanoes. What are mud volcanoes? That's what they are. When the Earth regurgitates, I, I love that regurgitates. I don't know. I'm going to say regurgitates for the whole talk. Um, so this is when you have. Uh, fluids and uh, sediments flowing back up to the surface of the planet. Okay, and that usually occurs when you have overpressuring. When the, for some reason, the fluids and the sediments are beneath, uh, become higher pressure so they have to escape. And that can happen because you have uh, um, gases that are developed by microbes. For instance, this is a case of uh, uh, an island that formed in Pakistan overnight. All of a sudden you have islands popping out from the ocean. And those are what you see here, individual mud volcanoes. It can happen because of earthquakes. You know where this picture is from, Alcance Loop. This is after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. So that's because of fluid, uh, fluidization of, of sand. You know, you basically had quicksand forming, actually a volcano forming right in the sloop. And, uh, or they can form on the seafloor and create this uh, volcano-like features like the one here is from, uh, from the uh, offshore, the delta, of the, uh, the Nile Delta, which can be uh, tens of kilometers large. So again, this is sediments, mud, and gas flowing back to, uh, to the surface of the planet. A place where you have a lot of this phenomena, both mud volcanoes and deep hypersenian basin, is the Mediterranean Sea. This is because uh, you, um, some of you may know, but uh, in the, in the, at the end of the Miocene, during the Mycenaean time, it's about six million years ago, the whole basin dried up. It's crazy, but that's the leading theory. 
which is that because the, of the closure of the Gibraltar Strait, the, the, the basin that was actually, you know, like now, a, um, a constrained basin, but with still, still water, actually evaporated out. So all the byproducts of evaporation, uh, therefore, evaporites, formed at the bottom of the basin. So those deposits, or salt deposits, are actually uh, underneath the seafloor throughout much of the Mediterranean Sea. And some of them are leaking. And that's why you have so many deep hydrostatic and anoxic basins there. And there's a place in particular, in a really beautiful place, I would say, offshore of Crete and Peloponnesus in Greece, where a lot of those basins are. And that's where we went in our, on our cruise. And by the way, this is the ship that I sailed with in 2011. That's the Meteor. Actually, there's a, uh, they, uh, they, um, they have a new one now. So I got to sail on one of the last cruises. This is a, one of the German, um, the German government cruises that uh, support research in the Mediterranean Sea. And the majority of the, my colleagues were microbiologists and geochemists. And, and we went to uh, explore one of the first deep hyperstamine anoxic basin ever discovered back in the, in the 80s, which is called the Urania Basin. So we are here. This is, again, southern Greece, Peloponnesus. This is the island of Crete. I don't know if I like this thing. It's kind of weird because everything gets dark. But what you notice here is that, uh, so this is, the, this is the location where we actually went. And uh, if you notice, there's a kind of a trench sticking out here. That's the subduction zone. It's a place where the African plate is diving underneath the Eurasian plate. So it's a really dynamic place, geologically speaking. And that's kind of a, a map showing, those are all earthquakes. So there's a lot of earthquakes there, you can imagine. And all these names you see here, those are different types of deep hypersaving and anoxic basin. They're all sitting there. Why? Again, because you have this ancient uh, salt deposit, they're actually getting uplifted by tectonics, and they're leaking salt into the ocean, and they form, and wherever you have depressions, you, uh, they form this uh, salty brine lakes at the very bottom of the ocean, okay? And one of them, it's an iconic place, it's called the Urania Basin, it's a horseshoe-shaped basin, so you can see it looks like a horseshoe, and the blue part actually is the brine, this deep brine, it's about, you know, more than 3,000 meters worth of depth. And this is an idealized cross-section that shows what the basin looks like. There's a, uh, there's seawater. There's actually, those are the two sides of the horseshoe, and that's the brine. Uh, and below the brine, there's actually a mud volcano. There's an active volcano of mud and fluids spitting stuff into the basin itself. Pretty crazy thing. And the other thing you see here, this is, a cold, this is actually the Messinian evaporites, so those are salt deposits I mentioned earlier, which are, uh, late uh, Miocene in age, about seven million years. And on top of that, you have a series of sediments, you know, Pliocene and, and, and Pleistocene in age. So that's about six million years of sedimentary history. So we went there, and honestly, we went there, we didn't expect to find any, anything special. I mean, the place is special, but this place has been visited many, many times in the past. It's actually really, there was like a line of ships to get there. Uh, because, you know, everyone wants to get there, mostly to look at microbial activity. That's really... And I'll mention to you why. I mean, this is one of the places where you can learn about life in other planets. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, kind of attention on this place. However, we really found something very new, which wasn't expected. That's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So here's the basin. And the other thing uh, that's interesting, uh, which I kind of mentioned earlier, is that even, uh, even though uh, you have many of those basins, and some of them are next to each other, they might have very different characteristics, both in terms of uh, chemistry, both the depth at which they occur and the temperatures in them. For instance, this uh, uh, figure here from uh, a paper from 2006 by, by Maria Cita shows uh, two basins, the Urania basin, the, the basin that we're going to be uh, discussing today, next to the Atlantic one, which is only a few kilometers away. But what it shows is that the halo cline, those changes in chemistry that occur at depth, occur at different elevation. So again, there are very little microcosm next to each other, very diversified. And also, the chemistry is very different. So some basins have much higher salinity than others, and some other have a much higher methane con concentration and sulfide concentration. The Urania Basin, the one we I'm discussing today, is actually is the most sulfidic body, body of water ever measured on Earth. So there's no other place on the planet where you can find so much sulfide in the water. And there's definitely a lot of methane in the water as well. So chemistry is really crazy over there. So we go out there, 
and we again we go to this place where everyone has been going. We go to the same spot, longitude and latitude, and uh, we you know use the echo sounder, and the echo sounder pings the seafloor 3,600 meter. Like cool, we start deploying multi quartz, gravity quartz, uh, CTD uh, rosettes, all the you know usual stuff that we do out at sea, and so we start deploying our our, um, our uh, multi-core, and once we reached 3,600 meters, there was no slack in the, in the roof, meaning that you know, there was no seafloor. So like, okay, we're getting the numbers wrong. You know, let's lower it a few more meters. And then, okay, let's lower it a few more meters. So this kept going for like a day because we were so afraid of slamming this thing on the seafloor. Then it turned out that the, the multi-core went down another 130 with these 120 meters more than where the seafloor was supposed to be. So that was a little puzzling because uh, we, you know, we really couldn't understand what was going on. And eventually it landed somewhere, what now we call the non-conventional seafloor just because we don't have a better name. So it got kind of entangled in this uh, crap at the very bottom, but the, our original seafloor was actually much deeper than we thought it sh should have been. When we have deployed the CTD, uh, rosette, that's what we pulled out. So that's a CTD rosette. The whole thing was completely covered in this murky, stinky, I think I have a picture of my, yeah, this Andreas Teske sniffing the, the mud. It was this stinky, you know, oily, uh, weird thing. I mean, that's a CTD rosette. If you know, if you know what I'm talking about, it's, you're supposed to bring back like nice, clean water. That's what we got. And, uh, and the, the, all the sensors that were on the rosette just failed beneath this depth that used to be suppo was supposed to be the seafloor. So what we figured out, I mean, and here as you can see the original data, is that there was a big change in, in, in uh, salinity at about 3,465 meters, which correspond to the top of the brine. And then eventually somewhere around 3,600 meter, all the sensors just failed. They just stopped logging. And you can also see both increase in, uh, in density, that's the purple, but also the increase uh, in, uh, in temperature, which is the red curve. So the temperature went from, from uh, uh, about 14 degrees to 18, 16 degrees, and then eventually failed here. So something was happening down there, and we really didn't know what was occurring. However, what we noticed right away is that the depth at which everything went crazy was actually the depth at which previous cruises back, uh, you know, in the end of the uh, 90s were um, finding a, a big increase in temperature. There was a very big increase from about 16 degrees all the way to 30. Actually, they measure up to 50 degrees Celsius. So something was special about that boundary. We, we empty the Niskin bottles, and that's what we get. So we get, uh, you know, seawater. Then we get this uh, salty water, which is the clear brine, and then we get mud, mud, mud for 120 meters. So the CTD rosette went through 120 meters of mud floating in the ocean. Uh, yeah, clean sheet, yeah. And uh, also notice, I, I really like it, maybe at least the water down here. Don't drink that though. So it was obvious that it wasn't just water. There was an upper brine, what we call the clear brine, and then there was this weird, fluid mud in suspension, and then some sort of seafloor, really, but wasn't really a seafloor. Uh, the story is longer. We deployed gravity core. We didn't get into soupy stuff. We never really got to see the seafloor there. And uh, uh, this fluid mud is, I was telling you the pressure condition. This fluid mud is super, super dense. So when we measure the density, we're talking about 1.6 to 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter. That's, um, and those are reference to show you what sediments on the seafloor, the density of sediments on the seafloor look like. It's about one to, you know, one, one to 1.2 grams per, per cubic centimeter. So it's a hyper dense 120 meters, uh, you know, mud bath, whatever you want to call it. In fact, the interesting thing was that the, the, you know, the line, the rope that we were pulling out was giving us a certain depth. The pressure sensors in the instrument were giving us a much higher depth. So it really, was really hard for us to even figure out at which depth we're actually taking the measurements because of that, just to tell you how crazy that place is. But what is also uh, was really striking is that uh, 
at, well, this was done after the cruise, obviously, I mean, right before, all, with all this data, is that 20 years before, people found the same thing. They just, and when I wrote, wrote, read the paper, they mentioned there was something really weird. I mean, it wasn't really weird, the, the word they used, but something like that. So they found a similar layer occurring at uh, the same depth in relation to a change in uh, light attenuation. So they have uh, uh, turbidity measurements showing that it was complete darkness down there. And, and there were other accounts talking about some mud sitting there and saying, we really don't know what's there. You know, it's really weird that you have as much mud in the water column. So that's us. That's me. You can recognize my haircut. And, uh, you know, and, I, I mean, and, and I'm dramatizing this a little bit. But those are the samples, and we were really perplexed. We just couldn't understand. What, what are we getting here? Are we getting everything? Is, you know, is it really seafloor stuff? Is it the water column? And that's actually the chief scientist, Kai Harix, uh, German. You can tell he's German. So how, what, what is it made of? How did it form? How is it possible that those chemoclines have been stable for possibly decades? And also, uh, how is it possible that the mud can stay in suspension for decades? And finally, where is the seafloor? Because that was a big deal. It was like, OK, we need to get a sample from the seafloor. Wh which one is the seafloor here? And we go. So here's the cool stuff that I'm very proud to show you from our lab. Scanning electron microscopy, energy dispers dispersive X-ray spectro spectrometry, and X-ray diffractometry. So now we have these beautiful toys to really investigate what this stuff is made of. And what you're looking at here, so this is 50 microns. So, so this is five microns. So basically a millimeter would be a couple of these rooms wide. So you're looking at a very high magnification. And that's what the fluid mud is made of, obviously. A bunch of particles. And actually, uh, the overlays, which is the other cool thing we can do here with the uh, scan electron microscope, is actually mapping, mapping of elements. So here I'm mapping three elements. Silicon is in, uh, in red, uh, calcium is in blue, and uh, sulfur is in green. And what you can, so now I'm going back to the SCM slide. And what you can see here is that uh, much of the, you know, based on the composition and based on also on the visual observation, is that much of what uh, makes up the, the mud is actually silicates. So these are, these are feldspars, can be quartz. So, you know, uh, pieces of rock, right? Or mi minerals. Then there's dolomite. There's a lot of dolomite. You can kind of see the dolomite rhombs here. Those are altigenic minerals, and I'll explain to you in a second what that means. There's pyrite, not surprisingly, the kind of bright spot there. And there's also a lot of gypsum, uh, a, a calcium sulfate. So that's what makes up the, 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 the mud. But also, I don't know if you noticed, there are also some real weird things in there. I, I'm sure someone already has seen these guys. There are these round uh, disc-like features, and some of them look like little sea stars. It's not a sea star, though. The, the magnification might be confusing, which are actually biogenic particles. So there's biogenic particles sitting in there. And, uh, so this is the fluid mud. This is the stuff in suspension. Then I'm going to show you a slide from the seafloor, or whatever you want to call it, the, the bottom. And you can see some of the same things here. This is the EDX uh, overlay, silicon, calcium, and sulfur. And here you go. You got this large silicate particle here. So it's probably a big piece of feldspar. You got gypsum. You have the pyrite. It's really bright. You have actually celestine, which is a strontium sulfate, which is another altigenic precipitate. And you have a lot of dolomite. And again, if you notice, there's one sitting down there. It's kind of cute, kind of sitting on a mineral. You have a lot of this discoidal features, which are biogenic particles. And now that you start seeing them, they're everywhere. They're actually part of the texture of the sand. They're actually the majority of the stuff. So what's, what's that? I mean, we were like, OK, what's happening here? Where are those things coming from? What are they? A primary microfossil is one slide because that's what I'm talking about. Since, you know, when I give this talk, people ask me after the talk, what's a microfossil? So plankton lives in the ocean. They die, luckily. And uh, some of them are made of a hard, for us, for geologists. They settle on a seafloor, and they make, uh, you know, the ooze. And basically, what I'm showing you today is 120 meters of this ooze, all the way up to the water column. And uh, 
Some of them have, you know, have tests, have R parts like coccolids, and, uh, and eventually those R parts might accumulate in the sediment and turn into little fossils or microfossils, which are little dinosaurs, okay? <laughs> That's my primary on microfossils. And, and, there, and we call nanoplankton little tiny, you know, micron-sized fossils that we really don't know what they were when they were alive. So we are talking about things that were in the ocean more than five million years ago, and we really can't tell whether they were phytoplankton, zooplankton, so we call them just nanofossils. That's a little tiny fossil. Okay, going back to our story, those are the fossils, well, those are the particles that we saw in, in there. One of them is a very popular one, is the Emiliana Huxley, which is a, a, a placol, this is a placolith of a coccolithophorid. Actually, this is a, a modern species. However, the, uh, the type of uh, uh, coccolith that we found there are very, very, very large placolith. So my colleagues think that those are glacial forms, so they are not modern. They're at least from the last glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, which is kind of curious that they are in suspension in water. But hold on. Then we have uh, Gerfirocapsa, Ericssoni, which was last seen in the late Pleistocene, early Pleistocene. So this guy was around uh, in the ocean around five million years ago, and now is up in the water column, followed by the retic Reticulofenestra pseudombilicus, which disappeared 3.7 million years ago and now is floating in the ocean. And my favorite one is the Discoaster. There, there's a Browarian circulus, but the Discoaster circulus uh, disappeared in the early um, Pliocene about four to 5.6 million years ago. Those are the uh, sea star things that you see there. So these clusters disappeared in the Pliocene. Now they're back in the water column, like a, you know, Jurassic Park, basically. <laughs> and notice how recrystallized this guy is, by the way. I mean, well, it's, you know, it's got five million years, so I'm gonna see you after five million years, what you look like. <laughs> so, but that's what's in the water, suspended. So we, it was pretty astonishing, to be honest with you. And I'm still, you know, kind of can't believe it. Maybe I'm making this up. So the other part of the particles that uh, are in suspension are these alphigenic minerals. So alphigenic minerals, for those of you that forgot my Jewish class, are minerals that form in situ, in place. They are not transported by rivers to the ocean. They are not made by biological activity. They are precipitate, and the typical example are evaporites. Uh, you know, when you evaporate seawater, you get salt. That's an alphagenic mineral. And there is, there's a whole slew of minerals in, the, in, the, in these deposits and in the water column. Most of them are dolomite. They look like rhombs, like the one you see up there. Um, there's, there's another one underneath here, and, and coccolith. You, you can find many coccolith or nanofossils. There's gypsum. Uh, more gypsum, more dolomites. Some dolomite specimens are really pretty. You draw really well shaped, although you're looking at fine microns here. So again, just think about the magnification. You're looking <laughs> at very small things that look big. That's kind of the trick of the standard electron microscope. Uh, there's this celestite, which is strontium sulfate, which looks like gold ingots. And finally, you have dolomite, dolomite, dolomite all over the place. So what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that something is making those minerals you know, precipitate, and most of those minerals are carbonates. Well, actually, there is an explanation from that if you think about what microbes do in this type of environment, and that's where we're gonna go next, which is a mad, a mad brine tea party. So as, well, as I mentioned earlier, those uh, deep hypersaline and oxybasin are an isolated body of water. However, they are also uh, interfaced with this, you know, the seawater as well as the, you know, the, the bottom, the, se the, the seafloor. So you have fluids rising from the seafloor, as I explained earlier. You can have uh, water, sulfate, salt, gas, mud. You can also have hydrocarbon, you know, coming up as methane, all sorts of hydrocarbon. Plus, you have um, you have in situ microbial activity, which uh, can use some of these electron acceptors to perform just basic microbial activity. So for instance, you can have the development of biogenic methane due to acetate-based methanogenesis. So you're, tur you're turning acetate into, uh, into methane. You can turn uh, acetate into methane also through sulfate reduction. And here's the sulfate as electron acceptor. You can actually turn um, 
hydrogen into, into methane as well. So you have biogenic methane being produced. So you can also have thermogenic methane being introduced there. Then you have another series of uh, uh, electron um, um, exchanges which turn uh, methane into, um, into energy. So you got one of the major reactions actually, which is the one that we know that's happening in the, in the uranium basin is the anaerobic oxidation of methane through sulfate reduction. So you're, you're oxidizing, I mean, you know, it's an oxic, but you're oxidizing methane by reducing sulfate and you're turning, you, you know, you're producing hydrogen sulfide and notice bicarbonate. All these reactions are producing bicarbonate, both on this end of the equation and the other end. So you're increasing the alkalinity in the environment. So one of the typical byproducts of microbial respiration is the formation, a change in alkalinity in solution and the precipitation of oxygenic carbonates, which is dolomite, which is a calcium magnesium carbonate. So that will explain why you have so many uh, oxygenic particles. But to do that in the water column is a different thing. I mean, I'm not talking about sediments, you know, or subsea floor. We're talking about 120 meters of water column, or whatever you want to call it. So that was quite surprising because it tells you that stuff has to be in place for a long time for it to happen. I mean, you don't precipitate uh, dolomite over time, overnight. Um, so th this is actually a geochemical profile through uh, through the system. You can kind of already are familiar with the slide now. Seawater, upper brine, clear brine, salty water with no mud, a lot of mud here, about 120 meters, then you get in the sea on the whatever it's called seafloor. Those are actually geochemical data, uh, uh, some of them, uh, showing uh, uh, chloride, magnesium, and also temperature here. So those are the increase in temperature. This, and so what, what you can notice pretty clearly is that there's increase in you know, chloride here. In the, in, the, in the clear brine, and then eventually actually drops back, not to seawater values, but, but it's significantly less than in the clear brine. And this kind of same thing happens to magnesium. And the interesting thing is that this chemoclines have been stable at least for 20 years. So they haven't changed over time. All the previous cruises have found the same uh, changes in, in, um, in concentration occurring within five meters, which, you know, given our inability to really measure depth there is pretty astonishing. So my friend, uh, Tobias, oh, those are my other, so this is a German ship. I love to sh show the slide because it tells you how different things are when you sail on a German ship. And the real meaning of port call, which means you just buy beer as much as you can. That's what a port call is. And those, <laughs> And those are my, these are great uh, geochemists, uh, Matthias Zabel, actually wrote several geochemistry books and, uh, and Tobias Goldenhammer was the lead, lead author of the paper I'm showing you today. Uh, so what they worked on is a, you know, the, the, the question was how can you keep uh, chemo, chemocline of the sort stable over time? I mean, eventually diffusivity will get rid of them, right? If you put salt, like salty seawater next to less salty seawater, Diffusion will just homogenize everything. So they came up with a really, uh, well, I can't help you. We came up, let's, let's brag about it. We are a really cool modeling exercise that's based on uh, this fluid dynamics package, open foam, uh, which basically allows, allowed them to couple a, um, a 2D uh, convective model with a 1D diffusive model. And, and so those are the model parameters. I'm not going to pretend I understand everything here, but they worked on four different layers, essentially, which is seawater, clear brine, fluid mud, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, seafloor sediments. So what they did using, uh, you know, um, using uh, basic, uh, basic modeling as an exercise using the Flick's law, they calculated how long will it take to the system to to get to the presence. So first of all, how can you keep those boundaries, chemoclines stable over time? And also how long will it take to the system to reach a configuration like the one that's, that you see today? And to boil this whole paper down in a few sentences, what they found is that if you run the model without the convection, but just the diffusion, after only um, 250 years, the you see this is the gray line, the boundaries will start dissolving. So if you just work on pure diffusion, eventually the, the, the whole stratification will start getting fuzzy and fuzzy over time, which makes sense because diffusion will tend to overcome the, um, those boundaries. However, if you add convection to the system, convection is able to keep the, um, the 
in, in the boundary is stable over time. And when they run all the different uh, models, and what you see here are different model runs, this is the legend, the dots, the white dots are the actual data, what they found is that the best fit is when, uh, and when you go back 1.7, yeah, I was, I was looking at the numbers, sorry, 1,600 years. So what, they're, what, they're suggest, what we are suggesting in this paper is that uh, the, the best fit, considering uh, the, the, you know, the taking for, um, for granted the starting condition of the system is that the, 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 the system has developed over 1,600 years, which means that the first event that generated the, the, you know, the, the occurrence of the scheme of lines occurred more than you know, 1,500 years ago. And it happened that uh, offshore the island of Crete, there was a major earthquake, which is documented in the historical record, about uh, 300 years uh, before Christ, B, uh, BC. So the paper uh, is kind of making the case that possibly this stratification and the mud itself may be related to that event, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, the other uh, part of the, of the slide here shows actually the a cross section with the uh, showing the convection model. Those are uh, I have the legend, so I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so those are so that those are convection vortices for the 2D convection models, and the other uh, uh, box you see up there actually shows the the stream velocities for both the fluid mud and the brine. So this is much I'm going to talk about this. However, it's really interesting from from our story because here's the thing. So thank you, Mary Silver, for these beautiful pictures. I know she's with us. In, in spirit. And uh, so that's marine snow. And you know, one of the paradoxes in the ocean is that the oceans are not garbage. Well, they're turning into garbage these days, but they are not garbage, meaning that there's a lot of stuff living in the ocean, floating around, very tiny. You know, if you just look at, gra you know, just Newtonian approaches to how particles settle, it will never settle. It will stay in the ocean forever. The ocean will turn into a murky, turbid body of water. However, as we know, it's not the case. Particles do settle, and eventually they go to bed. They go to the seafloor, and eventually they make bedding. That's because of the, what happens in the water column. And I have a little example for you, which I'm very proud of. So this is about, what's this? this is about one and a half meters. So if you take, this is really fancy animation. If you take one single particle, uh, 100 microns in diameter, and, uh, and you sink it, you know, It'll take two days. I, I was trying to make sound, but I couldn't make. It, it takes about two days to cover this, you know, section here. Okay. However, if you package it, if you lump it into a bunch of uh, poo, it takes two minutes. Okay. So that's you know that's the fecal express. That's why our oceans are constantly cleared up by by, uh, you know, from the small particles. Otherwise, right? they'll be staying in suspension forever. But there are places on Earth where this is not happening. Do you get the hint? I think we found one. Particle sizes. Those are the particle sizes of the sediments in the fluid mud and also the ones that are in the, on the seafloor. And so if you look at the particle size distribution, this is the x-axis is microns, volume percent. The majority of the particles are around 65 microns, which makes sense, or coccolith, placolith. So they're really tiny. And uh, you know, you have some outliers, which are those larger silicates, though they are in suspension, which is really interesting. They don't sink, really. And the coolest thing is that this is covering more than 100 meters of water column, which means that they're really homogeneous. There's no evidence that particles are settling out. That's what I'm trying to say. And when you look at the composition, any other thing we looked at, everything looks like completely homogeneous. So there's no se segregation. By many of you are familiar with the Stokes law. We apply the Stokes law to, uh, to particles that are below 63 microns in diameter. And the settling velocity in a in laminar flow is controlled by the difference between the density of the particle, the density of, density of the medium, times gravity, times the square of the diameter, divided by a constant and a molecular, times the molecular vis viscosity. So when you use the standard calculation and you calculate how long it will take to a four micron calcite particle of 2.6 gram per cubic centimeter to settle, uh, uh, you know, the this, this segment velocity is about 10 microns per second, which is 
pretty much what I showed you earlier. So, I mean, you know, it cycles very slowly as an individual particle. In the, in the, in the Arrhenia basin, there's no fecal packaging because everything's dead. There's no organic packaging of any sort. And so, for a single particle of a coccolite, it will take about 120 days or four months to go through 120 meters. However, as you saw earlier in the convection model, there are, you know, the convection velocities can be up to 10 centimeters per second. So there's enough to kick the particle in suspension forever, essentially, as long as you have convection. And by the way, I don't know if I saw that, if I, if I said that, but it's thermal convection. It's 50 degrees Celsius at the bottom, so it's constantly stirring. It's pretty obvious, but if I forgot that, I apologize. So, you know, the particles can see, be seemingly in suspension forever. There's no reason for them to settle. They're tiny. So even larger particles, even silt-sized particles, will not escape. So this is my conclusion. Awesome. These are my conclusions. I, you know, I don't want to read conclusions. It's terrible when you have presentation where you read over. But really, the, the main thing is that you have a system where, there are, you, where these particles are floating uh, in this endless uh, you know, uh, rabbit hole are coming from very different places. You have the biogenic particles, there are fossil particles that are probably coming either from, from this mud volcano, the spewing stuff from the bottom, or they're falling from the side. We're kind of deciding about that still. Um, but probably a combination of both. We also have microbes that are tapping into the system and they are, you know, performing respiration or, or chemosynthesis. They're actually, you know, as byproduct, they're precipitating new particles. They also stay trapped in the system. And uh, and then you have uh, and then you have uh, a, a a constant mixing which produces this homogeneous uh, medium. Uh, this is probably not the only place on Earth where this is happening. So now, in retrospect, we are looking at other places. One of them is this is the this is the the, 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 um, the offshore of the Nile Delta. So the Nile Delta is off, off here. There's a lot of salt cropping out on the seafloor here, and some of those uh, mud volcanoes, as you notice, they are filled with mud. So we think that maybe the same thing is happening also in other places uh, in uh, our planet. And I mentioned earlier, this paper came out a month ago in, uh, in um, Nature. I think it's Nature, yeah. And so this is the Orcas Basin. So, uh, you know, we're in the Gulf of Mexico here. The Mississippi River is, is there. And so this is a humongous uh, deep hypersilian oxic basin. And you see there's a scarp here. So these authors here have modeled what uh, happened when the, you know, when, when the summer in landslide occurred. And they calculated that you can, uh, you could have more than, you know, almost 400 meters of high waves being produced in that type of environment. And some of them uh, probably spilled uh, out of the winds of the basin. So just imagine a 300 meter wave propagating, it must be really spectacular. So very different, you know, environment from what we are exposed. In fact, much, much of this research is supported by um, the astrobiology program at NASA because those places are probably great uh, analog for life in other uh, planets and moons, including Europa, okay, where we think there's an ocean underneath this icy crust outside. So I think I'm done. I have just one slide. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I know it's open house, so I really appreciate you coming. I don't know if you noticed there's a, an individual hiding next to Alice. I'm done. Thank you so much. Any questions? Zoom is gone. Ah. I want Jim to see this. Okay. <laughs> so given that when this, I'm thinking about this silicate test that when they're in fluids, they dissolve. Um, and I'm thinking like even when kind of the silicic organisms end up on the bottom, they're still interacting with pore waters and they're still subject to dissolution. So is the idea that uh, the mud is thick enough in this kind of fluid mud that they, it's inhibiting dissolution? Actually, so I think all these guys have hydrogens. But there are silicic nanofossils, right? No, no, no the majority is carbonates and nanofossils, it's all carbonates. And actually, however, oh, silicate. Silicate. Yeah, it's quartz and phosphorus. those are minerals. So okay. then, yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, you're making a, and the interesting thing is that in the modern Mediterranean Sea, there's a lot of actually diatoms and, and uh, um, 
by the flagellates. And so if we don't find any silicious, silicious, yeah, silicate, and, so, and it's very alkaline there. So probably much of the, you know, you just get a lot of the solution. However, we found, and so the story is bigger, like any other story. We actually found fragments like this size floating in this thing, which actually have a lot of diton, fossil diton, which are probably spewed from underneath the seafloor. Uh, coming from ancient deposits. But right now in the basin, there's, a, there's a, a virtually no biosilica because of the very alkaline you know, conditions in there. Yeah. It's mostly cocal and nanofossils because we don't know what those things are. I mean, they've been around six million. Now they're repopulating the water. I, mean, I, I don't know, I like the idea that you have this fossil that's reconquering the oceans. Tyler, you had a question. The heat from below, that's coming from the volcano, right? From the lava volcano, from the Atlantic, it's a hot man uh -huh. rising, yeah. yeah. It's really stinky, the stuff. <laughs> Do we have any idea if those mud volcanoes will ever just shut off and then the convection will... That's a really off? good question. That's a really good question. I don't know how stable it will be over time, yeah. But eventually, if you shut off the, the mud volcano, the whole system must collapse and... Um, yeah, it might take probably uh, hundreds or thousands of years for it to actually be water and liquid. Um, do you think that like with the acidification of the ocean that that would affect us in a really weird environment too because it's so alkaline and super I don't think there's enough carbon in there to <coughs> Maybe that's what we should do. We should just use all these carbonates to deacidify the ocean. Yeah. But you know, one thing that uh, I want to <laughs> mention, you know, I was talking about the Mediterranean Sea, how it dried up, which is you know, a crazy story. You probably heard about that, right? It's a, so one of the, one of the things that uh, you should consider is that at some point, that sea was actually a huge brine. And so now there are these really weird deposits all throughout the Europe, which are these limestones who are, you know, have the same age. They're not clear how they form. So I'm thinking maybe there was more of this in the past. You just, you know, you just didn't know that the things could actually exist. Just think about having this super dense water, body of water sitting there. I mean, could have been the same kind of situation. Any other questions? So I was kind of thinking about like um, how like in regular volcanoes, right, you can sometimes have it on like kind of like a crust where two are coming into contact, but you can also have like a hot spot. Could that be something that happens in a basin where like a hot spot is like traveling and then it'll like move away from the basin and that would cause like no more convection to be happening yeah. or like that would be maybe a situation? Yeah, yeah. so we, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, one of the best examples of that is here in Santa Cruz. And I think, I, did you come to a field trip to the West Cliff Santa Cruz? So there's a system of uh, seep structures which are carbonates you know, kind of the same stuff, the which are associated with an ancient uh, system of basically mud volcanism, uh, you know, the cold seeps, which have been traveling. I mean, you can tell that you have systems that have been transferred over time, mostly because of tectonics. So as you're moving around, you know, as tectonics you, uh, uh, moves, you know, faults move, and so you can have those, the, you know, most likely the system is fed by a fault. The fault could seal and can move somewhere else. So that can happen, or the, the, the fluids that are brewing like that might actually stop brewing because say all the microbes have used up all the, all the you know, organic materials, so you just don't have enough fluid. But yeah, absolutely, so that might happen. So that you have a, a transfer of the whole system somewhere else. And the shape itself of those things, I mean, it's pretty, it, it's pretty, it looks very much like a volcano. I mean, if you look at this, uh, not in Europa, but if you look at this, uh, features here. I mean, they're, you know, they're like collapsed seafloors. I mean, look at these guys here. There. So, they're, you know, uh, so probably they start with a burst. You have a lot of the stuff coming out, and then eventually they become more, less and less active and they move somewhere else. But the cool thing is the association with salt. There's all this liquid with salt underneath, which makes, makes the, the water column super dense and just very different. So, you know, we call also those places zero gravity. That's why they're kind of cool analog for you know, life in other planets, because gravity, it's upside down. That was the title of my talk. Everything is weird. I mean, where's the sea floor? Where's the, which one is the water column? Sea floor? Like, it was <laughs> <laughs> I need to go back. Yeah. I want to go back. I really want to. Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what's the sea? I mean, you should see the course. There's, just, there's
there's never, there's never like an interface like, oh, this is SQL, it's all this gooey stuff, and that gets a little denser, and then you can penetrate in there. Katie. Yeah, so my question is, have you seen the Meg of honor? <laughs> oh, that's so <laughs> It doesn't seem like something you would have seen, but essentially the premise of the movie is that the Mariana Trench, like what we think is the bottom, is really a false bottom, and it's just this hyper saline layer. And so they go down the layer, and there's like a secret world down there, and they let this like ancient Megalodon out. And it that's in my paper. Money. So I <laughs> just saw like any Megalodon down there. Did you watch it? What is it called? It's, it's called, called the Meg. Meg. It's got, you know, Jason Statham. It's pretty cool. Did you watch it? It's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Next lab meeting. But yeah. <laughs> 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 you guys good? Open eyes? <laughs>